Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have really a great program for you today. I'm delighted to say that we um, have with us Tim Tate and Michael Janis and Carrie Swinhart. Uh, what I'd like to do today with uh, three people, they have a lot to say, um, but we're going to hear from each of them individually to talk about their own work. And then I'd like to hear them discuss their collaborative work, their private commissions, and their public art. So I'm going to begin by introducing Tim Tate. Now, I should say many of you know Tim and Michael and Carrie, but to some people who are with us today, they're not familiar with your work. So I'll just give them a little bit of background about you, not so much your work. Um, so Tim Tate founded the Washington Glass School, which is in Washington, D.C., back in... Whoops. Are we okay? No, nope. did I get lost? Okay. There you go. Okay, thank you. So Tim founded the Washington Glass School in Washington, D.C. back in 2001. And Tim started working in glass back in 1989. I'll let him tell you more about that. And he's one of the first artists who integrated video art into his sculpture. For me, his work is absolutely mesmerizing, and I'm sure it is to anyone who's familiar uh, with his work. In 2012, uh, Tim received a Fulbright scholarship um, in Sunderland, England. And in 2019, he represented the United States at the sixth edition of Glass Stress Exhibition at the Venice Biennale. So that must have been quite an honor for you at that point, Tim. Um, and of course, you found it Glass Successionism with um, William Ormus. Um, and after, when you have a chance to talk, we'd love to hear a little bit about the Glass Dress ex Exhibition at the Boca uh, Baton Museum. I don't even know if that show is installed right now, but I know it's running through until the end of the year. So that's something that people should see okay. for sure. Okay, I hope I get a chance to go down to Florida to see it. So before Michael Janis began focusing on glass, he was an architect both in Australia and in the United States. And my understanding is you worked a little bit with glass as an architect. And when you came back to the United States, I know that you wanted to focus um, your energy strictly um, in, in glass and developing in that area. In 2005, Michael became a co-director of the Washington uh, Glass Studio and the rest is uh, the Glass uh, School and the rest is history with you and Tim. Uh, Michael also received a Fulbright in 2012 at the University of Sunderland in England, uh, part of our Commonwealth here in Canada. Oh, yeah. And uh, taught- We got this together by the way in a rare I know. We normally do that, but they did for the two of us. Yeah, you know, we didn't really discuss it, but it became pretty obvious that you did together. Now, Michael did some research over there. I don't know if you did that as well. Yeah. We, we were on the same. same you were both. Yeah. You both did that. Okay, great. So, um, Michael's work is in numerous collections. I didn't mention Tim's, but I know that your work is in the at the Art Institute of Chicago, which to me was pretty impressive. What a fabulous place that is. And Michael, I think that your work is really remarkable. Um, and you're going to explain, I'm embarrassed to even try to explain it, but I know that you layer uh, sheets of glass and that you use crushed glass powders to really paint with. Um, and it's art, absolutely remarkable drawings. I mean, there's so much emotion, it's hard to believe what your technique has done. And Terry, it's a pleasure to introduce you as well. Terry is the youngest and maybe the emerging member of the team, uh, but she's gotta be pretty good to be with these other two, with Michael and with Tim. They must keep you going. I'm sure that's for sure. I know that you graduated um, from Ohio State with an, uh, an MFA uh -huh. and that you've studied at Pilchuck and Corning in the Chrysler Museum. So that's not too shabby. You definitely have lots of great experience to keep up. Your work is really, really beautiful. If um, if some of you haven't heard of uh, Terry or seen his, 
her work, take note of it because it is, it is very exquisite. And basically by layering glass strands and lightly melting them from what I understand, you then slump it over a form that you make and there's just remarkable, remarkable work that you do. And of course your collaboration with these guys. So that's all I'm going to say because it's such a pleasure. It's time to let Tim and Michael and Terry say a few words. Thank you. I'm so glad you're letting us talk about collaborations because mm -hmm. honestly, um, that is the spirit of the Washington Glass School in so many ways. Uh, we're gonna show you a lot of works that are collaborative, including Terry is the newest collaboration because we believe that the best way to help artists move forward is to collaborate with an established artist and you can gain access to galleries. That's the way so many artists start and you have to be willing to share your heart and your techniques and your thoughts with these people. And then when they come up with new work, then they'll be the next generation. Yeah. Which we believe Terry will be. I and think so from what I've seen. Well, thanks guys. I got a little bit of a sneak preview, so. And I hear great things, great things about you from Tim and Michael. <laughs> So tell me, tell me, where would you like to start, Tim? I'm looking at the wall behind you, behind both of you. Oh, yeah, that looks like a good place to start. Well, it's sort of a good place. What I was going to do first is show a kind of a walkthrough of our studio. So you get an okay. idea of the space that we're in and what that means. And it's, it's you know, it's raw, it's messy, but it's, got, it's you know, what are you going to do? You know what? It's real. Is that what you want to say? It's real. Real. It's a very, very busy working studio. And we Definitely have, a working studio. Okay. Yeah. And, it, and we have resident artists here. We have public art go through here. We have so much happen and it all is simultaneously overlapping. But I will uh, go ahead and share my screen if that's okay, Sandra. And sure, that'd be great. You got it. And then I will go ahead and call forth the movie, which is here, hopefully. And I didn't mention, if you have questions, you can write them into the chat line and um, we'll try to answer them maybe during the tour or at the end, but certainly we'll notice your questions. And we cannot be stumped. So go ahead, ask anything you want in the chat box. <laughs> like all uh, we'll go through it. So here's just a quick view and I can slow this and stop this as we're going through, just to give you an idea of what our studio is like. We're just outside Washington, D.C., one block outside Washington. Washington's a very small city. And uh, we actually started in D.C. for a long time. And then the new baseball stadium kind of landed on top of us. So uh, they were happy to give us a ton of money to establish our larger studio out here a block out of D.C. So that's where we are. Many of you have been here, I know. But I'll just give you a quick uh, view of what we're going to see. So as we go on, you see that panel on the glass that says Nabu right in front of you? Yes. One of the things that we did here is we replaced the doors on the Adams Building of the Library of Congress. So those doors were in cast bronze mm -hmm. down here. Those cast bronze doors don't function anymore because they have proprietary hinges. And so we had them cast in glass by a very brave architect for the Capitol who decided instead of historic re uh, restoration, he would do historic reinterpretation, which took us eight years for the final to go on that one. And Michael can tell you more. Michael was the architect who actually drew up the plans, et cetera. Uh, we beautiful. also, besides teaching here, we're, we're a working studio. So we do a lot of commission works and public art. And this is something that actually, I think that the, the second in command of the architect of the Capitol had done a workshop and then he kept the sample of glass. And later on, as they were developing concepts for it, he actually Isn't that something? Used the glass yeah. sample to say, I finally can expand on this. And basically it's the same process you're gonna see on these bar relief tiles behind me and that we're gonna show the walls later. That's what he had made. So just move on so we don't take too long on this. Yeah. Uh, so there is the rest of the Library of Congress. American Craft Magazine did a whole story about oh, yeah. the process. Uh, you know, a lot of you knew my video domes. This is the largest and greatest of all video domes. It's three feet high or almost a meter high. Um, and uh, these two people are guarding the, uh, the, the, uh, the door to the underworld on that. 
this is the same process of the wall right here. This is one that Michael and I did because Michael and I work on these together and it is a huge, wonderful thing to deal with. And that is, these are eight different titles of eight different books and we'll talk about it later. It's called Lending Library. You have to guess those titles later. I can guess one or two of them. One or two, well, I'll, get, I'll, I'll go through them. I'll go through, I'll go real quick so people aren't too stumped. Yeah. Here's some of Michael's work here as we walk in. I, I'm gonna pause in this one little section here. We have to be zooming on this girl because I, this really shows his process and I'll do it for him because he never likes to talk about it. But I will tell you, those aren't drawn. These are, none of these are drawings. Every single thing you see here is because he took black powdered glass, sifted it over top of the glass and pushed that around to make every line that you see here all that is he's taken things and gone through it to make that hair he's drawn through it. Other ones he's drawn to make the outlines with the powder. Every line you see is done. All the shading, everything is done with him. Sifting yeah, powders and firing it on. Very difficult process. I've watched him do it for 10 years now and I'm still not sure exactly how he does it. Beautiful. A little, little magic on that. You can, see the, you can see the dimensionality of the piece mm -hmm. on the side. Uh, I have been experimenting with gold plating lately because uh, I just love gold plating. And I'll tell you more about these pieces when I do, although the left floral field is 42, oh, in that frame. Oh yeah, it's a frame we, we have here uh, that we've been using lately. It's just a beautiful frame. The 42 inch uh, field, that round one that you're seeing now is a 48, uh, 42 inch floral field, all gold plated. And it just looks gorgeous. Both those are supposed gorgeous. to look like they're from Versailles. Beautiful. Uh, here's our fairly messy studio because we have a lot of crates coming and going. But uh, here's one of Terry Swinart's pieces that we'll go over later again. Uh, just to give you an idea, that's one of those that she puts over a floor nice. and melts down. Beautiful, Terry. These are some of Michael's older ones that I love. Some of those portraits that he did look like interview magazines to me. I think they're beautiful. There's another one of Terry's right there. And those are done in the same technique, Michael? Yes, mm -hmm. but a little bit more uh, pop graphic uh, quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. These are, these are Terry's MFA work. That when she came here, she brought her work with us from Ohio State. And by the way, we're very happy to have her here. We rely heavily on our assistant. This is one I did with Kathleen Elliott. That's all glass. It's called The Forest. It's very Canadian. So we thought it was the perfect piece <laughs> to bring out today. Uh, Definitely. There, there are even maple trees in there. So it's just, uh, I have a fondness for Canadians since I married one. Uh, some of the endless mirror pieces you see are not necessarily just on the wall or two dimensional. They're very three dimensional as well. And of course you can't go wrong showing these thousands of winged victories, which I fell in love with by watching Audrey Hepburn in Funny Face because she was a model in front of it. This is work by our third partner, Erwin Timmers. Uh, Erwin Timmers uh, has a lot of themes of environment or uh, recycling in his work. And he also has a background in, in steel. So he really is a strong part when we do public art. And you're seeing a lot of components uh, as we're working on a public art project right now in the studio. Right, so this is this one here is, um, oh, oh my God, there's so many different ones. That one's for, it says goodbye in sign language for a lobby of a place off Gallaudet, which is the university here. We also have all these tiles on the table that you're about to see. My goodness, I saw those hands a lot. Here we go. So all these tiles that we see there. Yes. Uh, we had the parks, uh, parks and rec. Oops, I got to go back there, I guess. We had the parks and rec people come in here and they created their own art in essence. We're going to make a wall for them. So we had all the members of the Parks and Rec from the different departments. The police chief was here yesterday and a variety of other people. And they all made their own tiles. So cool. the, Very cool. Okay? So when the wall goes up, they're all taking ownership of this wall saying, oh, my, that's my tile there. And that represents them. They, they wanted this to be a bit of team building. But the thing with COVID was it kind of threw everything off. So we had to do it in stages of groups of four. Oh, it was, yeah, and it, it worked out nice. Um, there's more of the recycled art there. This floral field here is the same floral field you saw gold plated. Here it is in this cameo. I frequently put a video of someone peering through. 
because I do a lot of video and I like the feeling of where no one has to hide anymore. Uh, that's the first room that I'm, we're not going to go through this whole back room, but you get an idea of there's Terry working hard. <laughs> Those are the studio artists back there that are artists of residence here and they are a messy lot. And uh, we're not even going to take you to the cold room or the metal room. So we're just going to make this kind of a quick one. That's Terry. Okay. <laughs> and it is a nice thing because you were building wow. as well. Uh, we're really trying, trying to take the artists in, in glass and around us to the next level. So they're working mm -hmm. in our studio. We invite them on shows and exhibitions that we can uh, expand the uh, uh, showcasing of the different artists that are part of that. And sure. It's just kind of nice to have that kind of connection. And then hopefully these people go to the community, start their own studios. And right now we have a pretty good community surrounding us. There's one of Michael's pieces there. And that gives you kind of an idea of the studio we're working in. Um, we are celebrating our 20th year. Uh, that's a long time to be together. Uh, but there we are. So uh, I'll pull that on down. So how did the school come about, Tim? Uh, the school came about because in 2001, there was no glass in Washington, D.C. The closest, you had to either go up to Temple in Philadelphia or drive eight hours to Penland. And it was a really difficult time. And I did that for many, many years. I did that for a decade of driving eight hours to Penland to get my glass, which mm -hmm. I loved. I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. But it was time that something happened in Washington. Mm -hmm. I wanted something that was not a studio glass school because there were many fine studio glass schools. I wanted something other than that. So we teach electronics. We're much more of a, a blend of a variety of mediums and techniques. And we're almost all kiln cast. We tend to focus on realism versus abstract. So all those things are slightly different than a regular studio glass model. And we formed that way on purpose just to see if we could come out with different work and people were used to seeing. And I, I think we accomplished that pretty well. Put right. your own stamp on it. There you go, that's it. So now it's gonna to go to the presentation, if that's okay. Is yes, okay? please, that would be great, thank you. Nice There's way. been a few questions, but there is a Q and A at the end. So maybe what we'll do is keep those questions until then. Although I can always answer anytime anyone wants to interrupt the question, I have no problem stopping anywhere. Nothing throws us, so it's okay. Okay, so Dan, if there's any questions you want to reach out and ask at this point, you can. Okay, move it on. I don't hear. We're going to move on. Uh, it, it, Daniel, tell us. I'm going to even Daniel. My name mm -hmm. is Tim Tate. I have been showing. I started in glass in 1989. We started the school in 2001, we started on September 13th. 2001 was our first class. So as you can imagine, it was a difficult time. However, what we discovered that while that year, no one was purchasing art because everyone realized there were things more important and they wanted to kind of focus on home and safety. Uh, people love creating art at, during that time. So our classes from that moment were packed because the creation of art is the most healing thing you can do on earth. I believe I am only alive because the healing nature of creation. And I think if uh, most artists will tell you, if anything is going wrong, if they start focusing on that creation, they're gonna move forward. So I'll move on just a little bit here. That's pretty profound actually. Here's our beautiful studio in the glorious spot of Mount Rainier, Maryland. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, with the artwork here and with the artists, we are, encouraging them to tell a story and be more narrative in their art. That you need to learn your craft and learn your technique, but then take it beyond and put something of yourself into the story of the artwork. We were so proud of that sign when we made it. I can't even tell you. <laughs> 20 years ago. And it still worked great. Oh, I don't know, that's great. <laughs> still, it's still there. Still there. Uh, Sandra mentioned my early video work. This is a piece, um, all glass frame with a glass video. This is my take on uh, Ophelia. And uh, Glenn Adamson, who at the time was the director of the Museum of Arts and Design in Manhattan, is now the senior scholar at Yale, gave me the best review of my life for this piece. So God bless them. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, here's some of the video domes. I think there's a couple of people on here own some of these, and I still love making the video domes. 
Um, I've been focusing on other things, but you know, nothing is uh, I, I nothing says I can't go back. Good. I decided to do more of those because I love them Good. with all my heart. I, I would be in movies. If it weren't for glass, I would have been a movie director and I would have been really good at it, I think. This one is the one that is still out there uh, on the other room that you saw, the Guardians of Necropolis. These are filled with symbols of Egyptian Day of the Dead, uh, kind of uh, the Book of the Dead, rather, and those kinds of imagery as you fly. This video on this side that you see here uh, is you're flying through the clouds towards the moon. On the, the one on the other side is curtains billowing around an eye because it's the entrance to the underworld. So I was going full Egyptian on that piece. Uh, it was great fun, and there are probably 15 cast pieces in that. Mm -hmm. Someone's yeah. just asked if all the pieces in the dome are glass, and I'm assuming that they are. Is that everything right? This, everything in this is glass. Mm -hmm. everything, everything. Even the painted ones, because I, what I did, like on his shirt, that looks like it's painted. It is. It's white glass, and then I painted it. So yeah, sometimes I'll paint over over white glass frequently. I do that. So that's what that whole piece is there. Uh, this particular one, I read a story. This is more. This takes us into the newer range. So all these now are here and ready and available. So uh, this, I read a story where when bee populations seemed decimated, there were very few dragonflies. But when we had a healthy bee population, the dragonflies were uh, ever present. So in my mind, I thought that that was telling me how dragonflies were protecting our bees. So this is why it's called the protectors that beautiful ring of dragonflies around these bees hovering the, at, at the center at home. I use a lot of bees as you'll see coming up. Uh, this piece is called We Rose Up. Um, keep in mind that uh, while we're in a pandemic, this is not my first pandemic. Uh, my first pandemic was the pandemic of the AIDS crisis. And during that time, I lost many, many friends. Um, 14 friends, eight one year. Uh, so it was a, a very challenging time. And the way I deal with that kind of stress uh, is to make something. And in this case, you see the center figure, the Vitruvian man by, by um, da Vinci. And that plus sign is not a cross. It's an actual plus sign. Like if you're COVID positive, or HIV positive, you know, cancer positive, you have a lot of these things that are on that. But in this one, because these tunnels that we see, and I'll show you this next slide to show you what I mean, just to give you an idea of how they are. When, when you see down these tunnels, they don't exist in real life. We all know, we know it's an illusion. We know that you're really not seeing that tunnel, but you can't help but see that depth. Um, and in that, since, since it doesn't exist anywhere but in my mind, I can make it anything I wish. So on this one, I am seeing my friends who passed, there they are alive again saying, thank you for not forgetting, we're fine, and thank you so much for not forgetting us. And as you see, you can see so deep into there. They say for, if you can see past 13 images in an endless mirror, you're seeing into the next world. Here we see 16. So we're, the, you see the next life, but it's indistinct. So we leave room for faith in that side. This one is at the uh, Tacoma Glass Museum, and it's been hanging there for two years. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's coming home uh, the, at, in the fall, so I, I will embrace it when it arrives. Oops. Very powerful piece. Uh, literature dri uh, drives a lot of my work. Um, I'm obsessed with Mrs. Dalloway, which is the book by Virginia Woolf. Many think is the first example of feminist literature. The very first line of that book is a very famous line, and it was, it's, today, Mrs. Dalloway thought she would buy the flowers. And why that's important is Mrs. Dalloway, her morning ritual was she was to go out and pick and make arrangements of flowers. That was her entire job. And she couldn't stand it. She thought she'd go in to buy the flowers, meaning she was going to London, where her secret lover was, <laughs> and she could take control of her life back again. So um, that is, it's from, from that book, she lived in a suburb of London called Richmond, and the line from it is, as she talked to her husband, if I have to choose between Richmond and death, I choose death. And uh, that gives you an idea of that story. She couldn't stand that prescribed talk, but they're beautiful pieces. This is a, it's a gorgeous piece. In, thank you. 
inside um, inside the gallery now is this one called the Vortex. I just wanted to do something that was kind of um, almost like a time travel or the essence of desire in a way. I mean, um, it was Krishna who said that um, all is clouded by desire and as a fire by smoke, as a mirror by dust. But in an endless mirror with UV, there is no dust ever. And it's the inkiest black you can possibly get inside of a space. So having that surrounded by this UV reactive paints, and as you look in, you feel you're going down that tire, that tunnel of desire. You feel like you're being pulled into it. Even though you know it doesn't exist, you are drawn to that center. So it's, that's why that one's called the vortex. And um, black light also represents the path for me because I, when I was a youth, I was obsessed with black light. Uh, I'm also, I was a Buddhist for many years and uh, I wanted to show this one. This is the Bodhisattva of Compassion. And that is a Buddha that has attained enlightenment but cares for others so much that they stay behind to help. And they're also called the Buddha of a Thousand Arms. Uh, it's a very spiritual piece. Again, you can be drawn into it. I don't care how many times I see this piece, I am always going to be drawn to it like for eternity. It's in fact, I even have a video on this one. Um, I started to go to Endless Mirrors because as a child, I got, there was a place called Spencer Gifts somewhere prior to the Summer of Love. And I wanted to go. And the nearest one to my home in Washington, D.C. was in Paramus, New Jersey at the mall. And I somehow convinced my parents to drive me to Paramus, New Jersey to get my first Endless Mirror, which I took apart and figured out how it worked. So this gives you, again, the idea of this depth. This is how I, as an artist, see this work. Because I don't ever see it as just a single layer. I see this as this beautiful tunnel. This beautiful tunnel of, here it is, the Buddha of a thousand who's reached enlightenment but stayed behind to help others. But isn't that all of the essential workers today? There are thousands of them staying behind to help others. And so I thought this was the perfect example of that kind of caring. I did, this is a very recent piece. Uh, this is actually slightly out of order from the next one, but I'll just start on his. That frame is so beautiful. We <laughs> kind of made it up here. And I decided that if you look, if you're studying mirrors at all, endless mirrors or regular mirrors, your studies will take you to Versailles, the mirrored room at Versailles. And I wanted to do a piece that looked as if I walked into Versailles and yanked this off the wall. I wanted that lushness and that history. I love something that is partially 16th century like this and partially 21st century with the technology. In the, in, in the time of Versailles, this mirror would have seen absolute magic if they had a plug where I could plug it into. But this is still, uh, I just thought that was the whole richness of this doing the gold plating. So I've, I've been doing a lot of gold plating. Lately. Let's take you to Blast Stress. Yeah. Okay, may I just interrupt for a second? Sure. We have a question. Is the gold plating done directly on the finished glass or how exactly do you achieve that? So the gold plating, I don't gold plate glass because what is the point of gold plating glass? You can't see it anymore. And I love glass. So I try to honor glass. So I asked Billy O'Neill years ago, what does Chihuly use for those all those pieces outside? And he told me the formula for getting those. So I use the same polyvitro that Dale Jewell uses for those outside pieces. I cast it that way and then have that gold plated. Uh, so that is a gold plated poly vitro frame. Although the one you're looking at here on the screen is solid cast lead crystal. So it's a different one, but I mean, I would hate to take this beautiful green lead crystal frame and then go plate it. So I plate, if it's gold plated, it's going to be on the uh, acrylic. Boy, I love doing those. Um, Thank you. So this takes us to glass stress. So I can tell you just a little bit about it. Glass stress is the brainchild of the spectacular Adriano Barengo, who owns Barengo Studios in Murano. He is, he is trying to continue the exact same mission that Peggy Guggenheim started when she brought Picasso to Murano to use glass. She believed that if you brought great artists to glass, they would make great things, especially if helped by gaffers in these places. 
So Adriano's entire mission in life has been to do this in this contemporary art world. If you have been an artist who has shown in the Venice Biennale, you are off her glass. So the people that are in the glass stress show are internationally some of the biggest names known. So I show next to Ai Weiwei, I show next to Tony Craig, I show next to a, a huge, every person you've ever seen do a pavilion at the Venice Biennale. It is an honor to be part of that. Uh, there are very few Americans and very few people who are in glass. Me and Karen Lamont are two of the very few ones who start in glass. Although there's others, Americans like Judy Chicago and Fred Wilson, uh, but it is truly an honor to do that. The concept of, oh, go ahead, Daniel. Nope, all right. So the uh, concept of this piece was, um, I wanted to show, you know, this is my, as I said, this is my second pandemic. When this pandemic started, I was so triggered at the losses I'd had. I kind of buried my kind of PTSD of that very challenging decade where I'd lost so many friends and I saw people dying early. And I saw that this was gonna be the same thing as before, that it would be politicized and there would be government mishaps and that this thing would be lo much longer than it should have been if it had been taken seriously, just as the AIDS crisis was. So I was so triggered that I decided to do this piece. It's called Justinian's Oculus because Justinian was the emperor of Rome who lived in Constantinople in 541 AD and was one of the first people, large known people, to get the Black Plague. Uh, he survived the Black Plague, but one-fifth of Constantinople did not, and they started calling it Justinian's Plague. He said that he was frequently haunted in his mirror by the death of those people that were lost due to that plague. This is my interpretation of that, of seeing those people that are lost, that are kind of looking back at us. I wanted to do a few things. To be asked to be part of Glass Dress is such a huge honor that the first thing I had to do was honor the rich history of like Italian Renaissance and that in Italy in general. So the frame was so beautifully Italian Renaissance, that was the basis for showing it. I also wanted to honor all the people that are, have been lost, as well as those people who are helping. This could be essential workers in there as well. This one's really more about the loss of people from this pandemic and the last pandemic and loss in anyone's life in general. So I just want to see them looking back just as I did in the Vitruvian Man Endless Mirror saying, thank you for remembering us. We, we don't want to be forgotten and we're still here. Thank you so much for our recognition. And that's what this piece is about. It's 33 inches across, uh, all cast lead crystal. The middle is uranium glass. Uh, which was extremely bright. And we did it on purpose because we knew we were going to knock it back with this black paint here. And that knocked that color back just enough to be the acid green, which works so well with that olive green frame and really showed this particular, uh, the topic for me. It is now at the Boca Raton Museum. And then um, a blue version of this piece will go to the Hermitage in Russia in October. And then there are other plans for other Viennales and other things I'll be making for those. But uh, it's the truest honor of my life to be part of Glass Trust. And this is certainly an amazing piece in itself. Very powerful piece. Beautiful. Now, on a much <laughs> from that, I don't mean to be so happy to come back to this. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of collaboration, which I love with all my heart, uh, two people, I love their work and I love them is Jason Chekravarty and Jennifer Caldwell, who are lamp workers. And you can see, I, I just especially love her bees and his, his cast honeycombs. And this one's called Honey Home. And it's just that spirit of coming home and finding something, loving at home. And when this was in the studio, my God, everybody who came in, this was their favorite piece. I could have had Justinian's Oculus next to it. This one, they would have been invisible. This was for some reason, a very drawing piece, including that little tunnel in the very center where it really goes, um, you can really see back to that bee. Yeah. Beautiful piece. And that is in your gallery. Is it? it is. I get to enjoy that piece. I'll enjoy it more once we're not locked down any longer. Oh, and there's Jason. Jason is thanking you. Oh, thank you said, it was an honor. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, with, Jason. Work with Jason and Jennifer. I love doing, you know, collaborations to me aren't just 
I don't know what it is. You, you can help show someone else's work in a different way they hadn't seen it before. And you, the collaboration, the, the act of collaboration itself can be spectacular, which I'm going to come back to in a minute here. Uh, so hi, uh, hi, Jason and Jennifer. Another person I collaborate with is Kathleen Elliott, who I, I have pieces of her at home. And this one's called The Forest, as we showed when we were going through, a very Canadian kind of piece. And she did all these, our lamp work and that beautiful wreath in the center, again, giving that lovely tunnel. And keep in mind when you're seeing these endless mirrors, the dark is as important as the light. In other words, that empty space right. is what gives you the feeling of, of depth. And so on this, it's not just those beautiful lighted pieces. It's also that inky darkness that you see into, because in that tunnel of darkness, anything is possible. So whenever I look at these, I always think of those in terms of possibilities. Oh, now I'm coming to me and Michael Janice. We have been together a long time. Not as, not as husband and husband, no, but as <laughs> he wishes. And partners here in the school, and uh, this is us back at Penland, back in the day on the left. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of blowing. Uh, I don't do, I'm, I switched to casting pretty much now, but there we are uh, in that Penland blowing in the snow. We, uh, we had rented the studio for that. We taught in Istanbul in 2008 together. That's one of our students. That's the blue mosque behind us. Uh, Richard Jolly was there that year. It was a lovely moment on that. Where else? Oh, we are, this is where we got our um, Fulbright look. We're all official looking on the left. We actually put on clothes that, you know, couldn't be destroyed. So you, you clean up well. <laughs> you did clean up well. And so that is uh, Washington's ancestral home, George Washington's ancestral home, which had turned into a, a dive in the 20s and uh, they fixed back up. So uh, we did it through the Sister City program because all sister cities to Washington, D.C. are national capitals except Sunderland, England, which is George Washington's ancestral home. So they reached out to us and we went over and got the Fulbright there at the National Glass Center at the University of Sunderland. And then now here we are up, Michael and I, we're at, uh, in Miami now all the time, showing at the art fairs. Uh, we do a lot of art fairs. We actually like the process of the art fairs. I know a lot of artists don't. I love talking to people about the work. I love everything about it. I love the energy that's there. So. Uh, we do that. I'm going to let you talk soon, Michael. I don't, I don't mean to. I don't mean to talk my way all through this, but uh, so here at the school we do this a lot. It's called. It's a process called deep relief dry plaster casting, where that plaster down there is sifted plaster, as fine as cake flour. Uh, and if you push in, if you push your hand down it, you would feel it compress, and that's all it takes to make the mold. At that point, if I push my hand in it, and then I cast glass into it you would see every fingerprint on my hand. That's how detailed these castings can be. And that's one of the reasons these walls work so well. Well, we actually, we teach this technique. That was one of the techniques we were teaching in uh, Istanbul. And huh. it's one of those kind of things yeah. where we're saying it's such a great uh, process and it gets so much imagery that can be read into that and can be transformed into glass that we wondered why isn't it really going any further? We can try to make other people take it more serious and use it more because we had so many things we were doing. And finally, last year, Michael and I said, I ain't waiting for anybody else. Let's show the world that this technique can be spectacular. And that's where the walls were born. I'll take you through here. We, we had worked together on a lot of projects, but this is the first time we're saying it's just us and just our story. Right. And it's surprising. We've been working together for almost 20 years, and surprisingly, we actually super enjoyed the process. We work better making these than any other way we interact. Uh, yeah. it, it's a true joy to make these walls. I can't even tell you. Well, we get along better when we make artwork than we do working <laughs> in a studio as a business. My desk is just over here from his. Not um, far enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're working like, on a story, your focus oh, yeah. is different. And mm -hmm. one of the things about the artists who work from our studio is that we're all telling, we're all storytellers. So this sure. kind of fits into it. And Tim's alter ego is to be a movie director. These become almost like a storyboard where you, or even a novel where you're breaking things down to chapters that you're saying together it 
forms a full novel. Otherwise, there are a number of short stories. That's exactly how I look at these. These are novels, and those are the chapters. And we're giving you this story of this piece. These are, these are for instance, images about memory, etc. Here's one that is just images of nature, which is one of our favorite topics, by the way. And mm -hmm. this, one, this one is spoken for. But if anyone ever wants one of nature, Michael and I, first of all, we love doing the commissions on these. We've done so many of these. And we have different topics and different different titles to them, different uh, focuses, and we just love doing it. This one's all memory. We are all nature, rather. We would love to do all nature again. We'd love that one. Just to give you an idea of scale, each of these are about 12 inches or a foot size square each. Right. So that's how we start working in those multiples. So that's six foot by six. This last one's six by nine feet. Now, so what people, I said, go ahead. people can come to you with the topic then, and you will. Yeah. Yeah. Explore it. And now said, they said, do it. when I said we'll do another one on nature, I don't mean we'll recreate this one. No, no, of course no. Not. we have so many different images. We'll come up with a whole bunch of new fabulous images. So that's always the fun of it, you know. Uh, here too, we also do these smaller ones that you see here. The one on the, oops, sorry about that. The one on the right is images of love. Um, as you go around here, you see Michael's shadow puppet there. You see a broken heart mended. Uh, there's a, there's flowers in a uh, bouquet. All these different things are images of love. On the left, there's that library, lending library piece we have. And I'll just tell you, these are the titles of uh, eight books. And I'll go around the circle and just tell you real quickly. Starting with Frankenstein on the left and then going up. You see the center one on the left is Frankenstein. That's the easiest. Right above that is uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The very top one is The Goldfinch. The one to the right of that is Lord of the Flies. Then down right on the full right-hand side is Tale of Two Cities. Then below that is Of Mice and Men. There they are, men and mice together. The very, very bottom one is My, my Love of Mrs. Dalloway. There's that first line again. Right. And then the one up from that is uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. So just, we, you know, we like to play with those from time to time. The light film. These are 42 inches across, by the way. This is us making the very first one, which will always have such a soft spot in our heart because it is our baby. You know, that first one born, you know, you try to love all your children, but, you know, sometimes that first one creeps back in. And uh, so we really have a really soft spot on this because we were developing the concept at the time. It was, you know, it was so new that we didn't even know how they would look when we finished. Yeah, we, we had worked in different ways. We had also then documented it. We made little paper cutouts so we could say, what's the relationship of this tile to that tile? And then we would also discuss, because we made a lot more tiles than we actually used. Oh, I'm sure you had to. And we also were saying that one doesn't fit. Or I like the center element, but everything else I hate. And so mm -hmm. we would just talk about how we would reform it. Right. And, and so, and, and, and we... Also, because we've worked together for 20 years, there was no necessity to really talk about how the imagery would unfold. He was trained here by, by me and us. I mean, this is, this is we, we grew together to have a very similar aesthetic because we're in this storytelling, realistic mode here. Mm -hmm. And so it was so easy to work together. And there are, there are several different forms here. There are three different types. Some of these are drawings, like the man in the boat and the flying fish. Yes. And they are done the same way that Michael does his other drawings by sprinkling glass powder and pushing them around. Insanely difficult, but he does those. Any of the cast, oops, any of the cast, uh, like in this one, the red objects or that purple object, those are ones that I'll do. I tend to do the three-dimensional cast objects. And then all the, the bar relief, you see like a, the, the wood piece on the bottom or any of those, that's part of this deep relief dry plaster casting. We both do those. And then we, at the end of that, we rub ink into them and you kind of get all the detail. And this is what you have at the end. And they make an amazing presence when you enter into a room. So the first one went to a, a residential place. I'll show you some images. And uh, although I moved it from their residence, but uh, so it goes, we do residential, we do government places. We've done them in many different ways. It's really brought back to our, our work with uh, commercial projects or uh, commission pieces. We're doing a lot of public art. This is in the Maryland Parks and Rec. Beautiful piece. Hotel lobbies. You see how even the, if you can hold that space, you can hold any space. So 
hotel. Oh, is that lit behind? Is that that's how it works? That's, it's just, that's a light on top. See it? On top. Okay. Here's the, this is the original. I moved it out of the person's house. So I didn't, I don't want to yeah. bust someone's house, but uh, so we just kind of pulled this in there for this, just to give you an idea how it does residence. And of course we do large scale. This one's a 12 foot uh, tower or something, something like that. Uh, and we yeah, do these much more abstracted. They wanted color. They want to color. They want to abstract the color one lit at night. So this was one mm -hmm. of the, the ones. We Beautiful. Did. We've done those up to like 18 feet high. Uh, here's one of our, this is quite a large one at a health, at a health center outside of DC. Mm -hmm. And you see, uh, again, all these beautiful panels put in there. And then Gorgeous. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. This is the Laurel Library. So there's a lot of images of books. And some of the kids came and made ones. There's Puss in Boots and a Dinosaur. Oh, wow. isn't that we wonderful? A, we had staff in the library. We had neighbors in the area. We had kids come in. And what's nice about it is it's like a quilting bee. It doesn't matter how proficient they are. Because once you put it all together and kind of limit the palette, it looks like a great piece. Great this collaboration. <laughs> the, the building and the artwork were listed. Uh, the American Institute of Ar Architects gave the building an award for uh, outstanding library. And they actually right. cited the artwork as part of the process of describing the building. Very exciting, beautiful. We have a question, uh, yeah. Tim and Michael. Is, uh, is Terry involved with the, uh, the cast elements? Terry is involved with everything. So, <laughs> poor Terry, God help her. I, you know, I would like to say that it was only us, but um, Michael and I frequently, said, Terry, could you make a mold for this or could you, you know, help us with that? And she's worked uh, to the last bone. She's now moving to Los Angeles, not because we've overworked her, but because her husband moved there. But um, we will miss her and we'll have That's to. That's too bad. Her. I know it killed us all. But she also yeah. does. She does every kind of casting and she knows every technique we do better than we do now. So, <laughs> so we're very how happy. Long, how long have you been at the uh, glass school, Terry? Um, I think about two years. Pretty close. Not long enough, eh? Not long enough. Know. She denies it, but I said oh, I asked her for three year commitment. She says, no, I didn't, but I'm sure <laughs> I must have because I hate replacing her, let me tell you. Yeah. Her husband's miss moving. What can you do, you know? I know. It's like oh, kind of far away, unfortunately. A little that too far be, for long distance. The three hours is really killing me. You have, to, you have to find your own replacement, someone as good as you. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> That's this so, um, yes. Yeah, we've been uh, working through that. It's been interesting. So Michael's going to tell you a little bit about his imagery and how that works, because this powder thing is such an interesting way of, of working. He's going to tell us. Yeah, well, one of the things when we were describing the images and how we were going to play with them, uh, we, I, I just started doing the shadow puppets because I like that kind of imagery. I like that deep contrast between the light and the dark. And it also gave me a challenge to really say, how do you express uh, a sentiment and a uh, concept of handmade craft? And the idea that I'm going to go to the most basic way that most people approach art, and that's like putting their hand by a light source and throwing a shadow. And I like that directness. And I like that accessibility that people understand that shape and form. Let me brag on him for a minute. By the way, they say that hands are the hardest thing to draw. He doesn't draw. He pushes powder around. And still, his hand looks like a photograph. And it's not unbelievable. Yeah. He's very talented at all this. We don't like to tell him that unless we're on the <laughs> because he gets way too big-headed about it. But say, well. Yeah. Tim said it earlier. I've watched him do it. I don't know, for two years now, and it still just blows my mind every time he pulls them out of the I can't imagine it. I have no idea. I watched him doing it. I'm still like, I got nothing. How that happen? How do you do yeah. that? It's crazy. But here's, here, I'm going to talk about the process in detail later on, but you can just see you have to build it up. Since I'm using crushed glass powder, it's really fine. And when you fire it down, it loses its density. So you have to keep on building on layer and layer. These take multiple firings to get it to the darkness and the contrast that I want, but it gives me a chance to really be exploring how shadows work on an object and then see if I can sculpt it to really make it seem as though it's a dimensional object. Once a fly landed in the powder that he was sifting and moving, and the fly started spinning around, so he left it in and fired it in. <laughs> it did it while I was putting it in the kiln. The last possible step, a fly goes in upside down and it's spinning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
It's <laughs> enshrined for life in glass. So there you go. And that the you can just get such a great imagery with that. And then when the color is introduced to it as well, it just really to the next dimension. And the depth, when you see these drawings, which kind of give you a backwards depth, and then you see these things protruding out and are actually on the surface, these bar relief pieces have such an amazing three different levels of depth. That's probably one of the reasons that they're most successful. Well, I mean, since we're talking about it, I'll introduce myself. Look I'm how Mike. young he was. Oh, <laughs> you're such a baby. Look at you. Well, I grew the beard, so now I can. <laughs> my hair is graying as well. Tim has caused every oh. one of these gray. <laughs> is, is, is that a COVID beard or beard, or have you had it, it for a while? Before, before that, but the white part happened during the COVID. So. During COVID. Uh, I, I was originally an architect. I was an architect for 20 years. And when I was in Australia, I was doing a lot of building lobbies that had cast glass. And that's where I learned about the whole concept of using glass as a sculptural medium. And I love that. And uh, after 9-11, my, my wife said she wants to move back to the US and she wanted to go to Washington. I said, well, we're back, but I want to change my career. I want to work in glass. And that's what I wanted to explore. And so it was a thing that I had to kind of figure out how do I get that education. And I was actually doing glass blowing in Baltimore, living in Virginia, and then having to commute without a car from DC to Baltimore. And it was just a very tiresome thing. And I said, I got to figure out how to do this and learn uh, in a different way. And that's when I started focusing on Washington DC to get the education. And I walked into the Washington Glass School, met Tim, and they just approached glass in a different way. And I really responded to that. And I said, this is my new home. And I'm gonna find a way to explore glass from here. You know, when you first walked in, we had people trying to scam time all the time. So we were like, yeah, yeah. But then I said, you're an architect? You, you're, you were an architect? You mean you can draft? And he said, well, yeah, I draft really well. Boom, I called the other partner and go, oh, but we gotta get this guy in here because for public art, you need oh, someone who can draft yeah. really well. And that mm -hmm. made all the difference because now we could have someone who draft him. And then he came and worked. And I'm not kidding. This is not an exaggeration. He worked seven days a week, 10 hours a day for two years, nonstop, all the time. And we were so embarrassed that he worked more than the two of us combined. We had to make a partner. So <laughs> that's how we got here. Well, it, it is a thing. I mean, this becomes your passion. Once you're working in glass, it is like a, a kind of addiction. You just want to know more about it. And there's so many different ways you can uh, express yourself in it. And that became what I wanted to do. And, and there, it became something that I could really expand on. And so my work uh, really explores uh, the powders. And that's what I really like about it, that I can really get some kind of strong imagery by sifting finely ground uh, glass powder on that sheet of glass. And just by pushing it around, I can change the, the emotional tenor of that work. But there's gonna be so much expression by just moving powders on that sheet of glass. These are loose powders. If I walked by a fan, it would all blow away. Mm -hmm. and then I'd be sad. So I've learned to always make sure the fans are off and my path to the film is a clear path. Yeah, that learning curve was long. Right. Yeah, how, how did you take that direction to begin with? Was well, I, I like doing imagery in glass. And the uh, first time I was using found objects and I was doing image transfer, but they didn't give me what I wanted. Uh, Jeremy Lapisto, uh, he's an artist who now lives in Australia. He was doing a workshop at uh, Urban Glass in New York. Yes. And it was about getting imagery in glass. And I just went to that. And to me, that was what clicked. It's similar mm -hmm. to what Miriam Di Fiore does with her mm -hmm. trees and landscapes. But it's just something that I... I chose to go in the direction of being more figurative in my imagery. Much more difficult. I think it's astounding. And, and then we, he and yes. I went to Haystack, the Michael Rogers class, and that kind of pole vaulted us both up to a higher level of art. Once we started seeing how Michael Rogers views his work, uh, that was staggering for both of us. So that was, at that point, we stopped taking classes and started creating a lot of work. And, and my work, yeah. Uh, my work often deals with figurative shapes, but I like to explore backwards and forwards and saying I'm using cast elements on top of the figurative to start showing how the color and the shadows are affected to give it a different dimension and a different kind of uh, emphasis, the way that the artwork can take it in. And what about this piece? Is that what you did in that particular piece? Yeah, 
So yeah, yeah. all the butterflies yeah. are cast dimensional pieces. Yes. So you just do see how that light and shadow are thrown mm -hmm. across uh, the figure. Uh, and it really gets a different feeling every time that you see a different quality of light on the work. You know, I'm just going to point this out to if, if people look at this picture to show you how talented he is, you can see that she's wearing a sheer top. You see the skin under a sheer top, and he's done this by pushing powders around. It's crazy. I don't even know how to, we still I don't know. It's hard to imagine it. Yeah. Um, Michael, do you use a model for these, or is there someone, the it's face? Harry. <laughs> well, Carrie, there you go. Not me. <laughs> it is going to be very simple. Where a lot of times I'm just going to. Uh, originally, I used to use my wife for all of the modeling because I can change the features enough so it's not about her, but I can mm -hmm. have to do a quick pose. And, and she originally was an artist uh, as well, so she's quite happy to do these kind of poses. And sure. I used to tell people they're all my wife, and then they pointed to a male nude figure, and I say, oh, <laughs> "That's her husband." Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's but in a sense, I've also sometimes pulled the eyes off of one figure and put it onto another. So it's, it can be like a bit of a, just a morphing of that kind of identity. Because to me, it's about, and I will change the scale of the eyes. I will really emphasize the eyes. And so I will, yes. I'm not going to be making it about that particular person. It's more about the feeling that I want to express. The feature, a particular... I, I know that you tend to exaggerate or, or really show the eyes. They're all beautiful eyes in all of your images. And, and I don't mind that if it, it has a, a, a not direct relationship to that model because it's not about them. I have done pieces where they wanted it to be exactly this. I was commissioned by one of the uh, uh, agencies here for refugees to do something about uh, Ted Kennedy. And they wanted it to be when he was the lion of the Senate, even though it was a very skinny little thing. And I said, he's going to be very big. And so I ended up putting his head on Don Draper from Mad Men's body. <laughs> and they thought, wow, this is beautiful because it really gave it this, the way that they thought of him. And I said, there you go. It's, it's the ideal. But th I like the idea that as the artist, you can start transforming the shape to what you need it to be. And, and a lot of these pieces, I actually say that I do want to say that it is a deconstructing of them. So you see fragments of them where I'm actually blocking aspects of it so you have to kind of drawn into the piece to see more about them. Right. She's so beautiful though. The, the piece that's on the next slide, on the left actually was a part of a series where I've expanded on the cast objects onto that. And I've just started working in that series. So it's gonna be more is gonna be developed on that. Mm -hmm. The one on the right was, uh, I, I just like using those really vibrant colors to really play off the almost black and white quality that I'm getting in my images. Mm -hmm. And I'm also working in larger scale. And so these ones are, are quite large. This is uh, about five feet high by about just under three feet wide. And there are four parts. So there are four sections that go into it. And on, on, since I'm working in portraiture, I like telling a story and getting to the emotional quality of it. And that there's many sides to yourself and how you perceive your personality and how others perceive you. And they don't always align. They're not always exactly the same. That they're, in fact, there's conflict sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and I really also say just the way that you perceive someone by gender, by race, by age group, that you have multiple takes on that personality and that they all, don't always align with how you perceive yourself or want to okay. perceive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're having these kind of uh, imagery, you're saying that there's many things inside yourself. You have some things that are conflicting with, with uh, different aspects that you want to believe, but there's other things that you also say, well, I should believe in that as well. So that internal conflict, I wanted to start expressing. And just the way that we have all these people who used to be friends and are now at strife with each other, there's all these kind of things that how do you perceive someone else when you know aspects about them that you don't like? Pretty deep. Now we're talking oh, about- Oh, now we're going to oh. there. Again, one of the things we like to do here is we find that we find people that we know are going to become great artists at some point, and they're just starting off. And the best way I think you can help an artist is not standing over the shoulder and telling them what to do, but it's to do collaborations with them and then take those to galleries that you have access to. So we can start gallery out. We have many people here we've started over the years. And most, many of them have gone on to wonderful careers and they're in different parts of the country. And we're so proud of every single seedling that started with us. I can't even tell you. <laughs> they're ours forever. We'll espouse their, their spectacular uh, 
accomplishments till the day we die. And that what brings us to Terry Swinner. Well, I'm going to jump before Terry. So yeah. We do actually talk about artist covenant, that we all say that we want to build on everyone. We don't want to have someone who's going to feel like, oh my gosh, you, you've got, how come Tim gets all the awards? Tim gets all the attention. We want to say, get rid of that sentiment of negativity and just build on that. And if you have someone coming through, show them another artist here's work because it can only help everyone involved. We have a, a, everyone here has to sign off on the concept that everyone, that no one's success is at anyone else's expe expense. Mm -hmm. And we are happy for every other artist here's success, period. And we really hold to that. So if someone comes in here, even if it's not you, and it has been you for five times and someone else gets it, we are there applauding every single step forward by these artists. So we never get into a negative spiral here. We never hide our successes from other people so they don't get upset. It's always about everyone celebrating their moving forward in their art world. So that, that means you have a very cohesive, mostly happy uh, you know, studio. So let's give you a lot of credit. We're celebrating Terry, master, <laughs> master mold maker, I will tell you, and that's the truth. So go ahead, you wanna jump in here, Terry? Yeah, I will say that was one of my favorite things and one of the most profound things about moving here and working with you guys is just like the level of support and um, the way the studio is set up really, um, like you said, it's incredible. Like, okay, Tim got an award today and you know, maybe it's not you time over and time again, but um, it's always like a, a celebration, like a family kind of, I would say. Um, I jokingly call them my glass dads uh, between the three of them. <laughs> um, I get a lot of uh, a lot of wonderful hey, guys. Father's Day cards. Wait a minute. Hey. Yeah, ooh, oh, sorry yeah. about that. Uh, <laughs> I'll send them next year from okay. California. <laughs> but um, yeah, so one of the things that I have loved while I've been working here is I get to um, use so many different materials and explore so many different avenues that I maybe hadn't before. And so um, one of the projects that we were working on involved making um, molds of um, bodies, which I have, you know, body casting experience in the past. And so Tim and I kind of got talking about um, ASL, American Sign Language, and um, just the kind of how incredible it is just as a, um, as a movement of the body, as a, a concept, as a language. So it's really, um, I don't know, it kind of sparked our fire. And so we started talking about ways we could take it further. Well, let, me tell, let me tell them a little bit why that was of interest. Yeah. Uh, in my earlier days, I worked for the city solicitor in Baltimore many, many, many years ago, 30, 40 years ago. But when I was there, I was the, um, the liaison between the Maryland Task Force for the Deaf and also my assistant was non-hearing at the time. So I learned to sign fairly quickly in a matter of a year and got pretty proficient at it. And I would go to Gallaudet University and I would see the theater productions or the concerts. And the beauty of the sign language was more important to me than even listening to the songs or any of it. I thought this expression of beauty, and they had the best interpreters in the world. That's what drew me to it. And, and we've used them before, but now with a master mold maker here, I could make the full time and incredibly detailed pieces. Yeah, and I had some experience. Um, I dabbled in ASL when I was younger um, and I love to learn about it. I think it's a really beautiful language. So um, I had some knowledge going into it as well. So I was really excited to hear Tim's experience. And um, so I think this, yeah, this work is a kind of a cool in-between because um, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, this isn't the way that you would actually say I love you. You know, you wouldn't spell it all out, um, but it's kind of a, a meeting in the middle between the way that, um, you know, we might read English versus the way that um, it's spoken in this language. Very so. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's very cool. And it's been a fun process too, definitely. You know, just to show you how good a mold maker she is, that is not my hand covered <laughs> in purple paint. That, that shows you the casting of my hand, and it looks like my hand. I mean, it's amazing to the point where I, I realized that age spots on the back of your hand actually have depth. I now know that because they were cast in, into my hand, <laughs> including my chewed cuticle in one area. But she's Yeah, don't worry. I think we sanded those off. <laughs> Just clean that up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. When you're finished. All right, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Terry. So yeah, so we have a couple different... Um, ways or just ways that we've been exploring this language and so um, we started with I love you love um stuff like that that we've used before and then this one was a little bit of flair uh, voila 
in um, purple poly vitro, that material that Tim was talking about before. So we do do them in both poly vitro and glass, um, which has been cool. Oh, I just saw that just in the question in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, so some of them are poly vitro and some of them are glass. Um, it just depends on like the um, the weight and what we're using them for. So um, we'll show you they both, in a minute here. Yeah, we have a surprise coming up. I don't even think uh, oh. Sandra's seen it yet, but we've been- No, I've been waiting. I've heard yeah, about it. Yeah, we had so uh, a great. piece a piece we were um we've been working on the last couple weeks and it just uh we just finally put it together for you guys today for a surprise yeah, that one is in glass. i don't want to jump ahead there yeah yeah, yeah that's all right that'll be at the end Ooh, look um, at that that's so <laughs> like sandra said i did come here um kind of with my own body of work as well so i uh originally got my bachelor of fine arts in the university of wisconsin stevens point and then um I went and finished my master's at Ohio State. And then I came here, basically walked off the stage and um, got into a U-Haul and moved all of my stuff and my cats to DC. So um, since then, yeah, it's been a while there. I learned lots of different materials, lots of different, the way of thinking about art in general is really very different from my experience, especially like with an academic route. So it's been really cool to um, expand. Yeah. And all it looks like, like when I look at this piece, it looks very much like a textile. Yeah, um, so a lot of my, <laughs> I grew up around a lot of textiles with my mom and my uh, grandmother, are both quilters. So I um, have spent a lot of time around fabrics. I can um, sew clothing and um, yeah, I grew up on a sewing machine. But I love the idea of uh, casting it in glass and kind of that, um, the way that material takes it on. You, This is made out of glass stringers, which you might know if you've seen Tutzinski's work at all, like those really thin um, glass rods. Mm -hmm. This is a similar material, just kind of taken in a different direction. So um, rather than hers is all about, you know, layering and movement, uh, mine is really about kind of that, that textile pattern. So I do um, sort of weave them together and then I just tack fuse them so that they just uh, stick a little bit, they're melted together, but you can still run your fingernail across them and get that uh, lovely texture. And then I uh, usually have some sort of a mold that I slump them, I heat them over. And so this one, yeah, the first one is a face. The second one here you can see um, is a, a body casting of my hand as well as a form I've carved under them. So a lot of this um, is done, thank you. A lot of it is done with a, a plaster mixture, which is really nice because then once it's out of the kiln, I can actually just um, wash that plaster out of that space. So there's a lot of, of that interior exterior relationship a lot of negative space which um, is very important to all of these works so nice the way it folds over on the floor like that or on the pedestal yeah it's fun and it, it's a little crazy because you put it in and it's one of those like I think I know what it's going to do I, I have what I want it to do um, and then it kind of it does fold pretty naturally which is yeah very it does. Cool. very nice yeah. beautiful detail thank you yeah it's been a lot of fun it's a very cool process this is our big surprise. Ta-da! Wow, okay. <laughs> so tell us about this. Yeah, so very this is cool. um, <laughs> one of our, our very newest piece, actually, with Tim and I, our collaboration. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it or I should, but... Please do. This is your time, babe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was, um, we were kind of searching around for um, maybe like a, a shorter word that we wanted to work with. And um, we had all of this, one of... Tim's favorite glasses, and it's become one of mine too, is this really beautiful um, crystal gaffer. And so uh, we had some of that on hand. And it's, beautiful. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a stunning wow. color. And so we ended up swirling that with a little bit of um, their beautiful purple as well to create this word ego. That's ego. Mm -hmm. And ego. how did you get, and what about, I guess it's the light that's creating the dimension in the color. Yes. The way it's lit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are two colors though. The top one is pink and then the purple kind of swirls through that face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I'm excited to get it done for you guys today. <laughs> okay. And that brings so, us down. So I'll stop sharing and um, go from there. And if there are questions and stuff that Dan's been holding, we're ready. Okay, go ahead, Daniel. I'm now unmuted. I have a number of questions. So Tim, can you just um, explain once again how you create the endless mirrors? Sure, the endless mirrors, um, as I learned in 19, when I was a kid, uh, it's a mirror on the back and the front is a two-way mirror, what is called mirror pane, which is actually black glass with the tiniest bit of silvering on the inside. 
It's used in office buildings typically to darken the windows. That's why you see beautiful, shiny, sparkly silver office buildings, but inside you just see the outside kind of dim down a little bit. When you put enough light inside of that, it'll make the black glass in front disappear. It'll make that color in the glass go dark, go light, and it still reflects off that. So anything you put between it will now be endlessly reflected. There you go. Perfect. It does Thanks. look like it does look like though that you have this tunnel. And it does. And when yes. We're in the studio, we have people who are saying, uh, "How far back into the wall?" <laughs> I know. And I you know, being cheeky, said, oh, it goes into the, through the wall, we actually had to have a cutout into the outside world. And they're trying mm -hmm. to see where does it cut out to that, that place. Yeah. It's an well, technique. You know, we haven't had your pieces in the gallery that long, Tim, and we got them, you know, during COVID, but we did have uh, uh, someone ask how, how far, and I heard Daniel say it went through to the other side. <laughs> I do see a question on here about me and Bill Warmus. Um, yes. yes, go ahead. William Warmus, who is the former curator of Corning Museum of Glass and has written most of the books on Chihuly and a variety of other people, who is a scholar on glass and a spectacular friend and good man and a very brilliant writer. And in oh, 2007, something like that, uh, we were on a bus together at a studio, to, on a tour to go to collector's houses in Chicago during SOFA. And we just happened to sit next to each other and while we were there, we started talking about what Glass was doing in the 21st century. And both of us had realized that there's something going on, but we didn't know exactly what it was. We knew that things were changing in Glass. A lot of it was an extension of studio Glass, but there were other things happening around the edges like Glass Stress and a variety of other things just about to happen. So Bill and I started our decade long uh, mission uh, on, Facebook, there's a page and on Instagram called 21st Century Glass. And we have made it our mission in life to go to every art fair we can think of and show how glass is already a totally accepted medium in the fine art world. That was one of our big surprises that it was already there because we had heard how hard it was for glass artists to be accepted into the glass art world. But when you start in the glass world, there is a major acceptance the first piece that Bill and I saw, we rounded a corner and there was a one meter cube of polished glass by Ai Weiwei from his heavenly dimensions. And that's where we realized there's a huge amount of glass being done. And certainly- I saw that piece. Oh, I saw it as well. It. It's great. Yes. And, and now glass is totally accepted as a medium in the final. They're totally embracing glass. So mm. we go re-record all those things and all almost 10,000 images of glass in the 21st century are on the 21st century glass page. So if you're interested in what's happening in 21st century glass, uh, go to the page on Facebook or Instagram and just scroll through all those images. Great, thank you, Tim. Michael, we have a question about your technique a little. Do you use, I know you touched on this, do you use all frit in your drawings or do you also use color line paints? Uh, the majority of this, I, I, I feel no obligation to follow one technique. I'm not going to be a purist, but my drawings are all frit powder. Uh, I will sometimes embellish uh, additional color on the outside with some color line paints, but I tend to just use frit. I'll fire that in and I sometimes will back it with a, like a white enamel so you don't see through because then I can layer one image on top of another image and fuse that all together. So if I don't want to have the image bleed through, I will actually coat it with a white enamel or a black enamel so you can't see through it. Great, thank you. And then Stephen would like to know, are the panels glued or captured in the frame? For the mounting of the squares, I, I Yes. Bet. And that's gonna be, it's a structural silicone. So it keeps it soft and it makes it so the glass and the metal don't hit. So the, the panes of glass are all fired together. So even if he's got six deep, they're all one fired in one piece. And then that is in silicone into a metal frame. And I think just the same way like these are. These yeah, are exactly the same thing as the behind us. Now, are the drawings fired before or after the panels are cast? They're, they're fired, <laughs> they're actually a number of layers sometimes. And like the trees that you can see right here, that's actually a number of layers and I fire them together into a slab and then I uh, 
uh, trim that up and match the frame. But if you're saying about uh, the other parts, the other drawings, uh, these are actually being made simultaneous so I know what's going on and say, I think there'd be a relationship, but they're, they're done kind of concurrently so I know where I'm taking the story to go. And it also is a thing that I review with Tim as we work on a collaborative one to say, I'm going in this direction. Sometimes I don't want input from him so I can say I'm not being pushed in one direction. Sometimes I want to be pushed and saying, here's where I'm going. Uh, I tend to not explore and expound on every detail because I kind of want him to take it with fresh eyes and say he likes it or he doesn't like it. Great, thank you. And we just had a question come in from Anthony asking, are there any examples of Michael's work from when he was uh, an architect? I wonder if there's some continuity from his architecture to his glass art. I know you don't have images, but maybe you can touch on that, the continuity. Uh, we hadn't trained him yet, so. <laughs> well, there, there are some things. Uh, most of my glass art would have been in, in Australia, things in Brisbane and the Queensland Rail Station. I had done a whole lobby of cast glass where it's looking like it's undulating forms. But also I had done some prototype libraries uh, for the Gold Coast in Australia where we were doing these kind of elliptical shaped uh, library rooms and I was doing image transfer onto the sheets of glass that divided the sections of the uh, oval shape. And that's where I really like the idea that I'm getting an image that I can see through, but it's still there. So depending on how dense the imagery was, you had an op opaqueness, but a translucency as well. And, and that when I saw that there's ways that I could do it on my own without doing it in a mechanical manner, I like that a lot. And I said, that's where I want to focus on. Interesting how that developed. Good. Great. And um, the two of you briefly mentioned how much you enjoy um, going and exhibiting art fairs. Have you ever participated in the Collector's Art Fair, which is running right now? Uh, no, no. no. <laughs> running right now. There's something running right now. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I'm I, surprised too. Where is that? Yeah, it, it, it's in it's it's in England, and I actually believe this oh, year it. Oh, it yes, yes, yes. No, no, I did it. But it was called that was. Oh, I did that one. God, like ten years ago, I think. Yeah, and, and this year it is remote. Uh, and virtual. we also were in the Affordable Art Fair in London. We were in. I forgot. I won the London Contemporary Art Prize, second place one year. Uh, for one of the endless mirror pieces, uh, so we go over there. That's probably our second home is England. Uh, we know the people there so well because we were giving them a lot of shows here uh, with us, and also because we they gave us our Fulbright, and we spent right. contact with these people all this time. So mm -hmm. that's terrific. Uh, someone want to know what ink we rubbed in? That's called Vitrail, V I T R A I L at Dick Blick. There you go. It's a transparent black paint, if that makes any sense. The hands real, they're mine. Because I have <laughs> horrifyingly large hands. So they make for a, what looks like an oversized hand when you cast it, but it's just me. <laughs> it's for real. Yeah, it's for real. <laughs> and um, Tom would like to know, um, what would you like to do once COVID is behind us? Where do you see your work evolving to? Well, we have actually talked about where we want to go next. And, and right. a lot of our imagery, we've talked about doing more abstract uh, versions of our works and seeing how that would play out. Uh, we have some glass that we haven't actually tried casting with that we're saying, what would you know, be, be solid opaque white? How would that impact? Right. Would that look like marble if we cast one of the walls in white and rubbing? If we're thinking of that. Uh, we're also working on a very large 10 foot piece, ultimately, for hopefully the Venice Biennale, he and I. Um, I'm doing a giant glass tower, if you can imagine, uh, two feet by eight feet circular hollow tower. That'll be lived from inside and working on that. Um, and certainly in the walls, God, I mean, we have only touched on the colors and styles and, and themes that we could do in the walls. And that's mm -hmm. just such a labor of love. We'll probably always want to come back to that. Yeah, I think it always becomes fresh and anew because it's like writing a, a short story. I'm just going to say it, and then if I want to expand on it, I can expand on it. And if I want to say it's short and sweet, it's that one tile. When did you begin doing the wall pieces? 
last summer, was it? Is it only last summer or was it no, it's, before? It's summer before? Summer before. Summer, oh my God, I can't remember. We can't, we've <laughs> lost a year. We've yeah, lost yeah. a year. It's hard to keep track. Two of her from last year. Yes, yeah, so you've got a lot of exploration that you can do with the walls. Oh, yeah. And I guess with all of your work, but especially the walls. You know, we were, um, when we were doing it, we, when we said, let's just take it seriously, we thought we'd spend that summer doing that, plus our regular work. And then we just got so involved in the walls. And we were so, I don't know what it is, there's a tactile nature to it. There's a super spiritual nature. Every single one of these like chapters, as we call them in a book, are just so much fun to work on. And when you see them all together, the human eye is naturally, when they see a grid, saying what relation do these, these particular pieces have? And when you look at these large scale grids are like in a six by nine wall, you can start seeing connections going all through them on mm -hmm. different ones. Like there's in all images of fishing or here's a nature section or here's memory section. You can really kind of get the idea, especially in your own mind, these pieces might mean something different to you. Like the lightning bug kind of just over my head now, that piece that Michael did, that lightning bug to me, I grew up with a house in the Chesapeake Bay chasing fireflies every summer. So when I see it, it's an image of youth in a lot of ways. I think I think that, that all, we're always going to love doing them. I, I don't think there's an end to that, mm -hmm. uh, but we will, of course, we are branching out to do quite a few things. I mean, they're just... The problem is the opportunities are coming faster than our ability. We're going to have to hire two Terry's next time. <laughs> so they'll all yeah. keep evolving then. I mean, the walls will keep evolving for sure. Oh, of course. We also are almost, in a sense, playing a game of one-upsmanship. I mean, the piece that's right over Tim's head, he had just come up with that shape, and he just said, I'm going to try this. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen that, nor would I have thought of how he had made that. So mm -hmm. it's a surprise, and then it's like, well, if he's taking it to new yeah. levels, then I have to match that kind of game. Mm -hmm. And like, I know that we're waiting for the right opportunity to try the white one to see if it looks like a beautiful marble wall in a way. Um, we haven't even we haven't even gotten to all the potential of it. And mostly just because we're super busy with so many projects. We're working on three large scale public arts right now. We have, you know, shows coming up. We have our individual artwork and then we come back to the collaboration. So it's just a, a busy, busy time here for us in the studio. But we're not going to ever leave behind, I guarantee it. So where are your public uh, art commissions right now? Where are you doing? You said you're working on three. Uh, the ones we're working on now is one. We're working on that extension of that one for the Maryland Parks and Planning. We're working, yes. One is in Arlington. Arlington, near Tyson's Corner. Which oh, yes. is a giant sideways one, which is yeah, interesting. We actually, we're working with a Toronto art consultant on that. Oh, that's right. We're, we're your friends. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I forgot about that. And, and we actually met with them in Miami at Art Miami, and we we're like working at, while we're at the art fair doing drawings and pointing out what his mm. concepts would be. So it was a very unusual thing to be yeah. at an art fair and then talking about doing a public art piece in Virginia. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. And yeah. we also just started one for a Rockville, Maryland one uh, mm -hmm. that's in front of a mixed use development where the mm -hmm. client is saying they wanted to have a lot of different references to the history of Rockville. Yeah. I saw that um, Jill asked whether you did uh, the supermarket in Bethesda. Yeah. We did do as well. They had a parking garage. They didn't want to see into it. So we did the whole facing down the whole length mm -hmm. of the building. And yeah. that also was one of the ones that Erwin Timmers, who's our, our partner here, uh, because they wanted it to be all about uh, LEED certified, so about environmentally conscious, we had to use the glass from the original building it was demolished, but they didn't take it out properly. So we had to pull out all the refrigerated cases and take all the glass doors on the freezer units and pull them apart to use that glass. Uh, it says, are the cast pieces made from molten glass or melted frit or chunks? Uh, they're, they're melted glass and the not, not uh, molten. And uh, Myra and Hal are saying, who are our biggest influences? And I, I would wanna state that when we started this school, we, I was determined to focus on kind of realism. So when I came up loving Billy Morris and Thurman State, and a lot of these people who were doing very representational work, at that time, representational work was not considered the equal to abstract work. It was kind of what people did on the side. They right. let us use, you know, they let us use the, the kilns to, to do sand casting at Pilchuck at midnight after everybody else is gone and they worked it to death. But that's, that's what I love. That was my influence. I love casting more than blowing. I know it's blasphemous. I don't mean anything 
bad to anybody who blows. And I love representational work. And it, that's where I was going to go with this school. Mm -hmm. And I just want to see what would happen if a group of artists who felt the same way came together, what we could create. And I think we've created a lot. So I didn't mean right. to speak for everybody else. They can tell you their influence. Well, for me, it's going to be Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and Joseph Cornell. I, all of their kind Joseph of work where they're yeah. combining imagery to tell a new story. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's who I first jumped to when I'm thinking of that. I mean, a lot of the stuff from the 60s and the 70s are going to be the, by influences. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very cool. I have to say, um, yes. As far as I would say, like Mary Cassatt, I love a lot of her stuff, but Susan Taylor Glasgow is just oh, my love her. Oh my the gosh, I love her. Susan Taylor Glasgow's work. <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments of being here. It was I was gushing to Tim about her, and he's just like, "Oh, why don't we just call her?" Like, Sorry, what? <laughs> okay, yeah, her work is just mind blowing, incredible. Wow, well, that's great. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say our last question, um, what kind of work and processes are being done by the other residents in the studio? Mm. We have a lot of everything going on back here. Um, the, you would think with the limitations we have here, if not having blowing and most people casting and everything out of kilns, that the work would look similar. And that would be a wrong assumption because there has been, we've had over 5,000 students. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. It's a huge amount of people have come through here. So we've, we've had people come and leave, like Sean Hennessy up in Seattle. And I don't even remember, Teddy Hathaway out in California. We've had so many people that have come through us. And everyone seems to find their own voice. And I think it's because we are here supporting that new voice. We, no one's trying to copy anyone here. They're just trying everything they can. And when they find all of a sudden that, they, that this might be the beginning of their voice, we will be there to cheer them on every step of the way. Well, they're very lucky to have you. And I mean, looking at Terry, it's going to be too bad that she's leaving, but she's going to take you with her. Yes. <laughs> She'll come back as an artist, uh, a visiting artist, right? Yeah, Terry? there you go. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's what me and as a visiting instructor. When I have a reason to come down to Washington, D.C., visit the school, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Well, no. One day, one day uh, the, the best thing anyone who comes to us, the best thing they can do is become successful. We love it when any of our students move on and do some interesting work and, and find mm -hmm. success in their lives with it. So that's the biggest reward we have. We are thrilled when it happens. Yeah, but they're so lucky to have your support and your influence. I mean, just knowing that has to make a big difference, I assume, right, Terry? Oh yeah, especially yeah, yeah. right now. I'm moving across the country. I'm kind of mm -hmm. losing most of my roots, but I know I have you guys. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys back at me wherever I go. Thank you so much. We're your dads. Yep, my glass dads. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be back to see you on Father's Day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Father's Day, we'll have them come back. We'll have Deal. Yeah. Deal. <laughs> so Dan, do you have any other questions there? Or does anyone have a that question? Was our that okay. was actually our last question. Well, it, this has been, I, I mean, I'm seeing all the comments coming across the screen. Everyone's enjoyed you guys so much. Oh, and uh, it's been a fabulous visit. You, you really opened thank up you. and told so, us, showed us so much. Thank you, you. Can you believe it? We're artists and we love talking about our artwork. I know it's hard to believe. Toronto. Well, <laughs> I invite you to come to Toronto. I'd love to see you here in Toronto one of these days. So there's my invitation. Maybe better than me coming down to the uh, <laughs> to the glass school. Just get that border open. We'll come on by. You know, yeah, it's very a while, while, I think might take a little while yet, but soon the invitation will still be there. So thank you so much. It was such a pleasure uh, to have you. I hate to say goodbye. It's such a good time. I know. Oh, well. So go back and make some more great work, and. Um, I th Dan, did you have some uh, images you were going to show of available work before we say goodbye? I can certainly pop those up. Yeah, why don't you? We'll just run through those and then we will say goodbye. And we start with Terry. <laughs> oh, no, we start with Tim. So close. Love that. That's such a dramatic. Very. Picture. 
as I know your new favorite. <laughs> it's true. Well, you know, whatever I just finished or I'm about to finish is my new favorite. Yeah. The one thing we didn't talk about is uh, about how your work really leads back to the Victorian era. We didn't get into that whole field. We need another hour to talk about that as well. <laughs> I'm sure we don't uh, need that, but yes, I do like to bridge centuries, as they say. Yes, and we didn't touch on that, but look at this up close, beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's all Jennifer and, and Jason, and here's Kathy and Elliot, beautiful. There's my time warp. Mm -hmm. I like your story about those Angels, I'll call them. Sure. And some of the collaborative piece. Mm -hmm. the Living Library. Uh, sign. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And of course, the walls are always commissionable, so that's yeah. fine. Beautiful. Their eyes are so beautiful. The women's eyes always. Mm -hmm. It has a thing with eyes. That's astounding. This one is a little different than the others. Well, it's more sculpture and I was mixing, since we have a lot of ceramic studios around us, I thought I should actually start involving ceramics in my work. So it's actually a mix of ceramic figure and then the cast glass flowers on top. Is this a more recent piece, Michael, or is it? Um... About, about three years old. Or three mm -hmm. years old. I love the finish on the sculpture. A couple of very small, these are about 12 inches across as well, these small squares. Mm -hmm. Now, these things to note about Terry's, these shapes are actually the form of someone who's crouched beneath a blanket to reinforce that concept of oh, that one, uh, fabric. I was wondering about that one. Yeah, they actually have um, like drawings that go with them, charcoal drawings as Still well. Still underneath the fabric. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this was, I think one of the first ones that I did, this was for our Miami. Yeah, yeah there were two of them back to back. Mm -hmm. What's the scale of that piece? Um, this one is very small. I think this is what, like 12, 10 inches, and then the other one is much larger, about 20. It's hard to tell when you see it on the screen like yeah, that. Yeah, this is the little one. Um, I think <laughs> the other one we have left, this is the one that we went by in the studio visit. He mm -hmm. came back to it, but it's, yeah, it's pretty tiny. It's like a maquette. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is different from the other work. Do, did you want to just tell a bit about this work? Yeah, this one's called Seeking Home, um, and I had gotten a little bit into figure sculpting um, and wanted to try casting some of them in glass. So the back is actually a, um, like a traditional American uh, quilt pattern and it is screen printed uh, kind of, it's actually a uh, frit run through a screen that we had. Um, it seems very native in its own yeah, way. Yeah, yep. Um, there's a lot of uh, Native American um, patterns and stuff. For, I'm from Wisconsin originally. So a lot of the stuff up there is still very, um, native faced and so this is uh, a traditional quilt pattern that I um, cast it. So the back is a sheet of glass and this is just fired on with fit powder and the sculpted figure. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you so much. I hate to say goodbye, but maybe I have to. <laughs> it's been a wonderful, wonderful visit. Thank you for, you know, joining all of us. I'm sure everyone had a delightful visit with you. I appreciate everyone for coming. I can't tell you how much it means to have everybody supporting us like this over the years, especially. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Okay. Such an honor. Bye. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs> Bye.